Hey there, you're back. Ready to pick up where we left off? In case you didn't just come here from the first part of this Unreal UI tutorial, we are working on user interface widgets and a HUD class. We set up a widget bar last time and made another widget which has three of those bars in it. We did some basic testing to prove that it can actually do what we want it to do, display a percentage as a bar and also display an arbitrary numeric value and an icon. Now we need to get everything hooked up using our HUD class. Let's not waste any time then and jump right back in. So last time we talked about how for this specific imaginary game we want to allow the player to cycle through different view modes, each one having a different HUD layout. For our purposes we have four view modes which we made in the last video, represented by an enum. To recap, these are clean and pristine, which basically has nothing on it at all, minimal, which is the very reduced layout, moderate, which is our standard normal layout, and sensory overload, which is where we'll stick everything we possibly can show the player onto the screen at once so that they can barely even see the world view underneath it all. In fact, what we're really going to have are three actual layouts because the first one just displays nothing. So we don't really need to do anything for that. How we're going to do this is with again, UMG widgets. Rather than mess around adding or removing the individual widgets here and there at runtime, which you are perfectly free to do if you really want to, what we're going to do is make a single widget for each view mode, which contains the layout of the widgets we want displayed and we'll simply switch between those. Rather than make the widget first and then do the C++ like I did last time, this time we'll do C++ first, but just a quick diversion before that. In the last video, we started using the UE log macro to provide logging capabilities to our projects. The parameters for this macro are fairly simple. The first parameter is the category name. There are a whole host of categories defined by Epic and used in the engine source code, as well as in various plugins. Next is the verbosity, but honestly, I think severity probably would have been a better choice of name, but whatever. The values come from an enumeration, E log verbosity, and they're ordered from most nasty, important, or horrible called fatal right down to messages which have little importance at all and could be considered spam and they're called very verbose. For most of the time you want to use either display, warning or error depending on the nature of the message itself. Then there is the message string which is usually passed using the text macro. UE log supports the printf formatting style way of doing things meaning that if you include printf placeholders in the string you can add additional parameters for each one allowing you to inject specific values into the log messages that are written. If you are among the more eagle-eyed, or if you followed my advice and downloaded the project so you could look at the source code yourself, you will have noticed that instead of the very common log temp category which you see people using, I have created my own one. Having your own log categories makes it much easier to filter the logs and quickly find what you're interested in. There are a couple of different ways to do this with different macros you can call to define the log categories slightly differently, mostly to control their scope. So you can define categories for single files for example. I usually want to create categories for specific modules so I tend to do something like this. In the private folder of the module in which I want to create those categories I create a new header file and I usually call it something like customlogging.h. Into that file I add the following code. You can add as many of these declare log category lines as you like because for a given module you might want to define more than one type of logging category. That's up to you. The first parameter is the category name, and generally that's all most people are going to care about. The second and third parameters are the default runtime verbosity and the maximum verbosity that will be compiled. I'll go into how you can use these for more specific purposes in another video dedicated to logging. For now, using log and all will suit most purposes. I open the module's source file, generally it will be called module name.cpp. At a minimum, you will have either the implement primary game module macro call, if this is the primary module in your game, or for additional modules or in modules that are in plugins, you will have an implement module macro call. After that, you can place the define log category, my log name, as many times as you need to create the additional log categories that you have already declared. And that's basically it. In your CPP files, you can now simply add the include custom logging.h and you'll be able to use your new custom categories. 
In addition, because the logging structured log H is itself included in our custom logging.h, you can now also use the newer UE log fumpt macro, which results in arguably cleaner and more readable code. Back to our widgets. So in the IDE, I create one base class for each of the view mode widgets we want, namely minimal layout base, moderate layout base, and overload layout base. Remember, I don't need to make one for the clean and pristine view mode because that doesn't actually display anything. I make them all derive from our base widget class, U widget BB base, but you would be perfectly good just deriving them from U user widget. Later in the content editor, I'll create blueprint widgets derived from these, but we have more code to deal with first. Now, you could get all clever with fancy class inheritance here, and maybe in your game it might make sense to have a base class for all view mode derived widgets, with some key functionality in there, etc. But we're going to go for a flat design here, just to keep things simpler. In that regard, all three of our classes will have an HSP bar property, because we know all three need it in some manner. Also, all three will have a crosshair uImage property. However, the other widgets that they end up with will be different, which is why we're making three different classes, okay? If you remember, that meta bind widget specifier means that when we make a blueprint widget based on this, it must have a composite widget with the same name and type. Obviously, the type we will be adding is not going to be a UHSB bar base instance itself. The UHSP bar base class is marked abstract in the U class specifiers, meaning we don't want to create instances of the class, we only want to use it as a class other classes can inherit from. But any instance of a class which we make which derives from UHSP bar base can also be considered as a UHSP bar base. That's basically what the fancy sounding term polymorphism means. And those instances are I refer to will be of the blueprint widgets we create later. Don't worry, I'll clarify it all in a bit. Anyway, I simply cut and paste those properties into all three of the base classes. For now, that's all they will need, and right now we don't even need to write any code for them either. So, jumping into our HUD class, a HUD BB, we're going to add three properties, one for each of those layout widgets. This is because C++ doesn't actually know about the blueprint assets we will or might make. So what we're going to do here is provide a property which in the editor we can specify our widgets for, but also the C++ class can use. Here I'm using T subclass of, which is a feature of Unreal that helps properties play nice in the editor. As far as C++ is concerned, it's basically a U class type, but it is saying when you see this property in the editor, you can have a drop down list and it will be filled only with classes which derive from the class you used in the T subclass of. Unreal is also clever enough that it won't show any C++ classes in the list which are marked abstract. In our case, we should therefore only get the blueprint classes which derive from the C++ ones, because all the C++ base classes are marked as abstract. This is one way you can allow C++ to create instances of classes that it doesn't actually know about at compile time. So, our HUD class now has three public properties which will tell it the class of widgets it needs to make make for each of the three view modes. When we make those widget instances, we'll want to store a reference to them. So in the private section, I added three private variables for that. I decorate those with the U property, but I don't give them any specifiers and I don't want them exposed to either editor or blueprints. The U property is just there to stop them from being garbage collected as long as the HUD is still active. We will make those instances when the HUD runs in the begin play method. So let's go through what happens in that begin play. The first thing I do is get a reference to the current world object. In this case, I only actually need it for the next step, but I do store the pointer in a private class variable, just in case I need it again for something else later on. I use the check f assertion lines to validate that the three view mode layout class properties have actually been assigned values. If any of them don't, the game will intentionally crash and the message in the check f will be displayed in the crash reporter explaining why. This is designed to catch errors like this before you package a shipping game, because obviously we need to specify proper values for all those properties. The checks are ignored by default in a shipping compile. 
So, using that world reference as the owning object, I then create instances of those three classes from the properties, storing the resulting pointers in the private class variables with U property I just mentioned. Each widget instance is added to the viewport and its visibility is initially set to collapsed because we will set which specific one is shown later. Note. We use collapsed, not hidden, because hidden technically still has the widget taking up space, and collapsed doesn't. Next we grab a reference to the player controller, using it to get the associated pawn, and then casting that to our specific pawn class, a character BB. Finally, we call update widgets to set the visibility for whichever the initial view mode is. And as we mentioned earlier, that update widgets function will get called every time the player cycles between view modes. So what does that do? Well, first up, it calls the clear all handlers function to unbind anything attached to any delegates the UI depends on. In this case so far, that's only the player character delegates we created, but it could be anything. It then sets the visibility for all three view mode widgets widgets to collapse again so that nothing is visible. And then a switch statement uses the current view mode to make visible the relevant widget and hook up only the specific handlers that it needs to update itself. And finally there is a call to that player character broadcast current stats method to force the player character to send out the latest values even if there haven't actually been any changes. That should pretty much be it. So let's compile everything and fire up the editor. In the editor, in the UI content folder, I create three widgets using the C++ base classes as the parents. Minimal layout, moderate layout, and overload layout. Opening each in turn, I add the required HSP bar widget and crosshair widgets to them and make sure they have the correct names. And for the purposes of making them look different, I slap a few other image widgets in there just to fake the other widgets that we would actually have in a proper layout. Then I save everything. Kinda screwed up naming our HUDBB C++ class because, well, it's a base class, so I should have added base on the end of the name. Oh dear. How will I ever manage to live with myself? Meh, whatever. So I right click in the core content folder where I decided to make the blueprint for the new HUD. I select blueprint and in the all classes section, I start typing HUD BB and select our C++ base class. Because I've already made one earlier, I'll name this new HUD, uh, new HUD. I'll double click it to open it. And because I don't want all that node programming malarkey, I immediately close it and then open it again. That's better. Data only blueprint now. So I'll set the three view mode layout classes to the blueprints I've made and then set the current view mode to minimal. Save and close that and then set the test levels game mode to use that new HUD. Lovely. Click save everything just in case there's something I haven't saved and let's fire it up in play and editor and see what we have. Okay, so the game opens in the minimal view mode with only the tiny little dot crosshair and our minimal version of the HSP bars in the top left hand corner. We can move around just like we did before, but to see any change in the HSP bars we'll need to hit the run button so that we decrease our stamina. Or maybe do some jumps. Stamina's going down. It's looking pretty good. If I stop running, it should slowly start to go back up again. And if I crouch, it'll go up a bit faster. Switching to the moderate view mode now, we actually get to see the bar graph. So we can see the stamina going up and down as we run around. And if we hit that side blast button that I've got wired up to the X button on my controller, I can decrease it. Hitting that D-pad button again to change to overload mode. And we get the quite comically sized crosshair and a bunch of other images and stuff. Just to fake having lots of UI elements. And then of course the clean and pristine has nothing on it at all. And then back to minimum again. So everything seems to be working. So I know we went around the houses a bit there just to produce what is basically a simple widget. But this is after all a series for newcomers. And I felt it was important to go over things like T object pointer, T subclass of, bind widget, 
and the whole business of making C++ base classes and then making blueprints derived from them. The entire project should be up on GitHub before these videos go live, so you can grab a copy and poke around to your heart's content. If you find any of these videos useful, and you didn't already, consider subscribing to the channel. You might also like to join our little Discord server to chat about this and, in fact, any game dev related topics. Link in the description. I hope to see you again in the next video, and as usual, I wish you good luck in all your endeavours.